Uh, we've been in a series the last several weeks called Till the Walls Fall Down. How many of you have been blessed by this series? Come on, it's been really blessed. It's blessing me. But this series has been all about breaking through walls that limit us from progress. Breaking through walls that blind us from the good things that God has already put in place for us. Breaking through walls that overwhelm us because of their seemingly imposing size. Breaking through walls that restrict us from freedom, from new beginnings, and from the momentum that God already has, uh, is working in our lives. And our study, as some of you may know, is based on the moment when the people of Israel went on a, the first of many military campaigns. The, the first city they faced was a city called Jericho. And Jericho had a reputation of a fierce, mighty uh, group of people. These, these were fighting men. Their walls were impenetrable. And so they had a track history of only winning. And they were feared by many, including the Israelites. If you look at the scriptures in the book of Numbers, you'll see that they were afraid of, of Jericho. But the truth is that God did something miraculous. God gave them instructions, instructions that we've been learning from. And as they followed after all that God told them to do, those walls came crashing down. God did a miraculous thing in bringing those walls down without them having to lift a finger in battle. But there were key things that they had to do to see these breakthroughs take place. And what we, what we began to see throughout this entire series is that this battle was of great victory but it was for the purpose of a breakthrough, a breakthrough that was supposed to lead them to a land of promise. It was a breakthrough from where they'd been, where they, where how they, where they'd been stuck in their mindsets, in, in, their, in their journeys in the desert. It was a new beginning, meaning that God didn't just want them to break through. He wanted them to do something after the fact. He wanted to, them to break free. You see, friends, God is in the business of breakthroughs, but walking in freedom is up to you and I. And as we're going to see in a moment, the people of Israel had a great breakthrough, but it very quickly turned into a massive breakdown. And so today, I want to talk to you from the heart of God. I bring you no opinion of my own. Listen, my idea is I'm not that smart. But the word of God really is powerful. And today, if you will lean into God's word with me, if you will hear the word and accept it as it actually is, God's word, it will begin to transform your life. And the walls that stand tall will fall. Amen? Amen. Come on and give God some praise if you believe that. And so today I want to talk to you on the topic, don't let your breakthrough break down. Don't let your breakthrough break down. See, as I said already, God is in the business of breakthroughs. But have you ever experienced a breakthrough from some sort of sinful habit? Maybe a breakthrough from some, a destructive uh, mindset or a pattern of thought? Have you ever broken free from the foothold that kept you stuck in an area in your life? Have you ever had a breakthrough only to find yourself doing it again? Back at the place where your breakthrough began. Back at the place where you're stuck. Now, if you've ever been there like I have, right, I have good news for you. Because God's word has much to say about how we can break through and break free. How we can stay free. And so, uh, while God's people enjoyed a great victory at the walls of Jericho they suffered an even greater defeat because they lost sight of some things shortly thereafter this breakthrough. So let me give you some background for where we're going today. After Israel had defeated Jericho, the Lord had given them instruction. He told them, he told them do not take any spoils from this battle, meaning don't take anything of value from this battle. This was customary in those days. So he said to them, don't take anything for yourselves. Whatever you take, he says, you're going to devote to a treasury that's devoted to me, to my purposes. And so the people uh, have this great victory. They break into Jericho. They do everything God instructed them. But sadly, a man named Achan took some spoils. 
He saw some things that caught his eye, and he secretly took them and dug a hole in his tent, underneath his tent, and he hid them. Now, what ended up happening was that it became a, a, a problem, not just for Achan, but for the people of Israel. You see, it wasn't just Achan that did something wrong here. He had relatives that knew what he was doing, and they tolerated it, right? And, and so it was because they did not follow God's instructions, as we'll see, that it resulted in grave consequences for everyone. And the first thing I want to encourage you with this morning that I want to dig into that we begin to learn from this particular uh, instance is that a breakthrough isn't a breakthrough unless we break free from the walls that once stopped us. Let me say that again. You're going to have to write that one down if you're taking notes, right? You're going to have to make sure you highlight that, write that down. You got to chew on this because I'm telling you that this is the beginning of walking in freedom. A breakthrough isn't a breakthrough unless we break free from the walls that once stopped us. Let me show you this from scripture. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1, right? Achan has already done his deed and watch what God says. It says, it says, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. He took some valuable things. And so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Let's leave that verse up for a moment. Notice that Achan messed up, but God was holding the people of Israel accountable. We're going to see why in a second. There's a problem brewing here. There's a big problem brewing here. See, while the people experienced breakthrough, they never broke through, friends. They never broke through. Because breakthroughs are the first step to breaking free. What good is it to come to a place like this week in, week out, and get revelation from God's word? And see the truth and understand that God has a better way and then walk out of here the same. There's no breakthrough. There's no breakthrough. You see, God enacts breakthroughs in our lives so that we can begin to break free. And friends, if we are hearing the truth and we're professing faith in God, but we're doing the same old thing... The walls that are supposed to fall aren't falling at all. As a matter of fact, we're building them. We're the problem. Now's a good time to ask yourself, are you breaking free? Because you see, God has done his part. He's given us Christ. He's defeated sin and death. He's overcome the issue that has kept us trapped but now it comes to a point where we have to take hold of it. We have to begin to walk in this freedom. And therein lies the problem for many of us. See, historically, one of Israel's biggest downfalls, despite being God's chosen people, one of their biggest downfalls was their unfaithfulness in their devotion to the Lord. And here again, we see this issue coming up again. Achan was not the only one who sinned here. The people of Israel were also unfaithful because they did not consult the Lord concerning a battle. Now, let me give you an example. Let me tell you what's going on here. So, in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, we see God, we see that God is aware of what Achan has done. And he's, he's holding all Israel accountable. You're going to have to check this out on your own time. What you're going to see is that Joshua and the people of Israel now rally together and they go, okay, let's move on to the next city. And the next city was a small city called Ai. Very small city. Not many, not many fighting men. And so he sends out spies. They, they, they uh, spy out the land and they go, oh, you know what? They're no big deal. We don't need the whole army. Let the army rest. Just send 3,000 men. Joshua says, okay, let's go with 3,000 men. And they get their tails whooped. But there's, a, there's something that you can easily overlook. Any time the people of Israel went out in battle, the first thing that they were supposed to do was inquire of the Lord. They didn't do that here. They didn't go before God. Joshua did not inquire of the Lord. He got the report. He told them, all right, guys, let's get on to the next city, which tells us something. 
There was some pride at work here. They had a win with God, and then they dismissed God and said, we got this. We can do this. And what this begins to show us, friends, in the big picture, the big scheme of things, is that the one that fell here wasn't just Achan. It was also the people of Israel. And so there was a problem here because they were reverting back to the very thing that God was addressing for 40 years when they walked around in circles in the desert. A lack of devotion, unfaithfulness to the Lord. And so they suffer a loss. And as a result, not only did did Achan suffer consequences, the entire nation suffered consequences. Right? And so, though they experienced great victory at the walls of Jericho, they were still living in defeat, friends. Why? Because they had existing issues regarding their unfaithfulness to the Lord that they were not addressing. Let me ask you a question. Don't answer this. Don't tell on yourself. And please don't tell on somebody that you came with. Right? Don't be that person that kind of nudges them and says, see, I told you you were supposed to be here today. No, that's why you're here today. Right? Listen, now's a good time to ask ourselves this question. Is there an area that I've had breakthrough that I'm breaking down in? Is there an area? Is there something that God has brought me through that I'm going back to? Friend? If you are, maybe it's because you haven't started walking in your freedom. You haven't, you, haven't, you haven't done what God is calling you to do. Let me give you an example of this. Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, says this. It is for freedom. It is for what? Freedom. Come on, say that nice and loud with me. It's for what? Freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us what? Free. Right? So we have been set apart. What this implies is that there was a time where we were not free. We were stuck. We were subject to our desires. We were, we were slaves to our, to our evil ways of thinking. We were slaves to a life apart from God. We wanted nothing to do with God. And all of a sudden, we come to a revelation of Christ. We come to begin to understand that we're called to be followers of Christ and that as we follow him, it leads us to places of rest. It, it's, it creates a new life for us. It is a place of blessing. It's a place of increase. And so we've been set apart as free. We are free. Free indeed, the scripture says, right? So we have this freedom in Christ. So why do we go back to a place called stuck and the scripture tells us why it tells us stand firm then in other words this is the result this is the next step after breakthrough now you have freedom but we, now we have to stand firm and you see friend if your struggle is still strangling you friend Here's the reality. You're not walking in your freedom. We're not doing what we're supposed to. We're going to dig into this a little bit more. And so it tells us that we should stand firm then and do not let yourselves be what? Burdened again. Why? By a yoke of slavery. See, when you go backwards, what we're actually doing is walking into a jail cell. We're imprisoning ourselves. You know what's the worst jail to be in? The one that you're stuck in and you hold the key. And we have the key, friends. We have knowledge. We have revelation from God. We understand we don't belong there anymore. And so verse 7 goes on to say, you were running a good race. Somebody needs to hear this. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Who did you allow to cut in on you? What did you allow to get in your way that you are back where, you, where I set you free from? He goes on to say, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. In other words, God didn't lead you back there. God's not at fault for what you're doing and where you're stuck and where you're struggling and you're, strang and you're strangled. It says that kind of persuasion does not come from God. It goes on to say in verse 9, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. 
A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. So let's break this down. Let's dig into this a little bit. If God sets you free, friend, from porn, you got no business going back there. If God sets you free from addiction, you have no business going back there. If God sets you free from anger, you have no business going back there. If God sets you free and restored your marriage from infidelity, you have no business going back to him or her. No business. If God sets you free from a poor self-image, you have no business going back there and looking in that mirror. We have no business there. You have no business going back. See, the reason why the Israelites suffered a breakdown after their breakthrough was because they weren't committed to following through on their newfound freedom. Some of us, we're waiting on God, and God's waiting on us. Oh, God, I just need another breakthrough. I already gave it to you. Break free. Walk this out. Walk this out. We got to walk this out. And there's a reason that we begin to see why we get stuck, why we fail to stand firm. And friends, it's because we do not commit to the process of being free. I remember a story I heard once of Japan's most famous, infamous kamikaze. Kamikazes were fighter pilots in, World War II, in the World War II era that would fly their planes. They would make a commitment. They took a vow before every mission. When a kamikaze would get into their plane, they would not return. Why? Because they were committed to destroying their enemy by giving up their own lives. They would fly their planes into enemy uh, uh, vessels and would destroy the vessels and lose their life in the process. Now, this guy had had 50 successful missions, or so they thought. And so there's an uproar as he's landing and he's getting out of the cockpit of his plane. Everybody's excited and there's news reporters and all these uh, uh, cameras or you know, bulbs are flashing. And there's one reporter who's a little confused. And so he gets his turn and he, he sneaks a question and he says, Mr. Kamikaze, how is it that you have had 50 successful Kamikaze missions? But you're here with us today. And his answer was, well, I committed to the beginning. I just didn't commit to follow through. Friends, you cannot succeed at this thing called faith. You cannot succeed in following after Jesus. You cannot succeed in breakthrough if you do not commit to seeing it through by walking out your freedom. See, according to Galatians 5, what we begin to see is it's the little things that we allow to creep back in that begin to once again erect walls of sinfulness and create problems. The scripture tells us in verse 9 of Galatians 5 that it, a little, uh, it, it's just a little yeast that works through the whole batch of dough. It's the little things that we allow back into our lives. It's the little decisions that we begin to make that we know are inconsistent with God's word. It's the little things, the little habits that we pick up, the little, the little attitudes that we maintain, the little thoughts that nobody hears and nobody knows, but God knows. It's, it's those little things, the little things. See, Aiken's situation, right, Aiken's sin teaches us that a lack of commitment to walk out freedom is a result of a lack of attention to small details. Oh, it's just one little item. It's just, just one little thing. It's just one little drink. It's just one little conversation. It's just one little text. It's just one little view. It's just one little thought. But you see, big things are made up of a compilation of many small things. Small things. See, we, we think of uh, doing things that are wrong as these big things. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that sin in and of itself, 
sinful activity, sinful mindsets, sinful thoughts, sinful ways, that they are all equal. It gives us that example. Why? Because if you break one law, you broke them all. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for the forgiveness of Christ. Thank God that we don't have to pay the price. But I will tell you this, while you're not responsible to pay the price, you will pay the consequences of your choices. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. See, the only way to avoid breaking down in our breakthroughs is to stand firm. To stand firm in what God has done and to stand firm to walk in it. Can I tell you why? Look, there is nothing wrong with music. There's nothing wrong with being in a party scene. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But I'll tell you, for me, that's not a good thing. Because for me, being in a club, being in that type of environment takes me back to my red zone days. It takes me back to my uh, Latin Quarter days and, uh, you know, a, a, a Sound Factory days and the tunnel and all that. Don't look at me like that with those judgmental eyes of yours. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We probably ran into each other. We just didn't know each other back then. But you see, for me, it wasn't just the environment. It was everything associated with it. It was everything that I was doing. It was the way I thought. It was what I believed about myself. It's what I believed about women. It's what I believed about money. It's what I believed about life. It was destructive. And so there are little things that take us back. Friend, you might be free. You are free. But here's the thing that we struggle with. We still remember. And what you remember and dwell on, what you give space to in your life, that will live. And that may just rob you of your life in Christ. The second thing I want to share with you today is that breakthroughs become breakdowns when we choose to stay down. Let me say that again. Breakthroughs become breakdowns when we choose to stay down. Here's the reality. Breakthroughs are not a guarantee for a life free of mistakes. Hey, go ahead and tell somebody, you might as well accept it. Tell somebody, you might as well accept it. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. We are going to make mistakes. We're going to drop the ball. And so breakthroughs are not a guarantee for a life free of mistakes, but they do guarantee us what we need to get back up. It is a guarantee that we can get back up. After Achan's sin was discovered and the Israelites suffered an unexpected loss of the people of Ai, Joshua and the elders went on a downward spiral of despair. Listen, they, they had a temper tantrum. Seriously, look at it in the scripture. These guys got all spiritual according to the customs of those days. They tore their robes off. They, they bowed down on the floor, and they're all crying, boo-hooing, oh, we've messed up. We're just so bad. We've let God down. We've, we're not faithful, and they're beating themselves up. There's a difference between acknowledging where you've gone wrong and condemning yourself. And so they're having this tantrum, but that was the wrong response. See, they made a mistake. That's a given. They made a mistake, but their response was the wrong one. Because instead of lifting their eyes and getting back up, they were busy being spiritual and beating themselves up and not facing what was the real issue. It got so bad. I, I never saw this until I really was studying for this series. But it, it, it's crazy because Joshua started to blame God. Let me show you this from Scripture. From scripture, Joshua chapter 7, verse 7, it says, Then Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord. Oh, man, this sounds like a great prayer. <laughs> this sounds like this is going to be a powerful prayer from a powerful man of God. Alas, sovereign Lord. Why did you ever bring these people across the, the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites? To destroy us? Do you, do you realize what he's, what he's saying? 
God, this is your fault. You did this. He goes on to say, if only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Don't miss what Joshua is doing here. It sounds like a great spiritual moment, but Joshua is having a breakdown. He's blaming God. And to make matters worse, he's saying that it was better in the place before the land of promise. He's saying, we were better off back there when we were walking around in circles for 40 years. We were better off back then when we thought like slaves. We were better off back then when we were disobeying God and doubting God and being selfish. We were better off back then on the other side of the Jordan is what Joshua is (laughs) saying. We were better off in a desert place. Where nothing grew and we had to rely on God to bring about miracles because there was nothing there. That's what, that's what Joshua's saying. And, and, and watch God's response to Joshua in verse 10 of chapter 7. It says, the Lord said to Joshua, say that with me, what? Stand up. Stand up. Say that because, say that like you're reading it with an exclamation point. He said, what? Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? What are you doing down there? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs And run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. You know what God is telling the people of Israel there? You know what he's telling Joshua? As long as you're down on your face, you can't face the thing that you're doing. You're so busy crying and complaining and moaning and condemning yourself. And being all spiritual that you're not facing your sinfulness. You're not addressing it. You're not doing anything about it. God wanted Joshua to get up from his lamenting and self-condemning response for a reason. See, friend, as long as you're beating yourself up and crying about your mistakes, you cannot change where you're going wrong. You can't. The issue... Friend, is it that we make mistakes? That's not the issue. The issue is that for some of us, we are still choosing to stay in our mistakes because we're not doing anything to address them. God already gave you a breakthrough. But you and I now have to break free by working out our salvation in reverence to God. We've got to work it out got to work it out. If you think that faith in God is about laying back and God, you do it all, you're missing a valuable point. God gives us freedom, but we have to take freedom and stand firm in it. We've got to be resolute about it. We have to be determined to walk this out. We have to make the decision, I'm not going back. I'm just not going back. And so the question is, how do we begin to do that? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 22, gives us some indication. It says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust, that's just strong desire, and deception. It's a lack of understanding. Instead, let the Spirit renew your what? Thoughts and attitudes. Your thoughts and attitudes, something's supposed to be changing. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Watch this. Here's, watch how practical the scripture is. Stop telling lies. Stop, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Watch how practical the scripture is. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't, don't, don't sin by letting anger control you. Now, anger is natural. We all experience anger. 
But here's where it becomes sinful, when anger controls us. That's called wrath. That's called anger without control, without boundaries, right? So don't let it control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Watch this. Watch how practical it is. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work. And then give generously to those in need. Watch, watch how practical the scripture is. Don't use foul or abusive language. Stop cursing. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. You see how practical the scripture is? Here's what the scripture is telling us. It's, it's, it's actually teaching us two things here. Right? The right way to get back up after a breakthrough and when, we, when we fall into some sort of sinful vice, according to the scripture that, that we just read, is to cast them off. But it's also to put something on. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The term throw off in the original language means to cast off oneself by way of renouncing it. Now, for some of you, you're thinking, oh, I've been doing that all these years. I, devil, I renounce you in the name of Jesus. That's, that's not renouncing. It's not renouncing at all. The best way I can put it to you is think of it like a shot putter. Right? A shot putter grabs a heavy ball, right? And their aim is to take this heavy object and launch it as far away from their starting point as they can. The farther it goes, the better off you are. What is the scripture telling us here? You got to take those things that you keep on, that, that you dress yourself with those mindsets, those struggles that are strangling you. You've got to take those things and you've got to launch them as far away from you as you can. But that's only half the solution. According to the scripture, the other half is you have to put something on. You have to put on the nature of God. In other words, you have to replace what you took off. Because if you don't begin to replace it, you will always go back to what you only know. You go searching for that. So how do we put on this nature of God? This nature of God speaks of God's character. It's interesting, in the original language, it also speaks of his constitution. In other words, his values, his morals, his ways. In other words, if we're going to cast off, if we're going to throw off of ourselves those things that keep us stuck and strangle us, we have to also put on the nature of God. You've got to begin to do things God's way. Maybe some of us are still struggling in this area. You have to make up your mind that even though that person hurt you, you hurting doesn't solve anything. You have to forgive and you have to let go. Yeah, when you show up to work, you have to operate with integrity. You have to do what's right even when it feels hard and it feels wrong and everybody says it's wrong. We have to begin to make godly choices. We have to begin to react, uh, relate with people in a way that uplifts them, that where we shine light wherever we go. Friends, we have to reflect the nature of God. Why? Because it's the image that we now carry. And daily, in putting that on, what that tells us is that it's a choice that we have to make. I have to choose to forgive you. I have to choose to be kind. I have to choose to do what's right. I have to choose to stand for the truth. I have to choose not to compromise. I have to choose to be a man, a woman, a person of integrity. I have to choose to be faithful in my marriage. I have to choose to be strong, even when it feels like, man, it's better just to just give up. we got to make that choice. The last point that I want to leave you with here today from this uh, example that we have in scripture is that to break through you have to break away from some people you're going to break through you, you, you do have to break away from some people we can't miss this Achan 
was an Israelite. But you have to understand that Achan came up under a new generation. This was a generation that God had destined to enter a good land, a place of promise. It's a place of freedom. It was a place of blessing. It was a place of goodness and opportunity. But you see, Achan blew it. And because he blew it, he blew it in such a way that it affected others as well. Now, the rest of Israel may not, may not have been responsible for Achan's sinful action, but they were complicit and accountable because some of them kept him still in their midst. God said, you got to address this issue. You got to break away from this person. You've got to remove this from among the people. And what that tells us, friends, is that we have to do the same. See, the company we keep and the people we follow sometimes become the very walls that need to fall away. I want you to take a moment to be honest with yourself and be honest with God. Take a quick scan an evaluation of the people you hold dear to you. Are they helping you or hurting you? Are they helping you or hurting you? You see, God's not going to lead you into relationships where you don't have the strength to stand. But sometimes we try to do things in our own strength. And we reap a lot of problems. Yeah, relationships matter. The people we keep in our company matters. There came a day when Jesus told a man, come follow me. And this man was on the verge of a breakthrough. He had suffered a difficult situation. We're going to read it in a second. But Jesus is inviting this man to follow him. For all we know, this guy, they, they, maybe they were supposed to be a 13th disciple. I don't know. Don't know that. But Jesus invites this man. He says to him, follow me. Let's see what happens and what we can learn from that as we close today. Luke 9, starting at verse 59, says that he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first. Lord, first. First. Let me go and bury my father. Watch what Jesus says to this man. Let the dead bury their own dead. Now, let's pause right there for a moment because it almost sounds like Jesus is being insensitive here. Like, like this is, to, to some people, they might go, man, that's, that's kind of like being a jerk. Right? Like, why would you even treat someone like that in the midst of their loss? But I would submit to you that Jesus was actually being loving here. Because Jesus says to him, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is proposing to him a new life, a new beginning, a new calling, a new purpose. In verse 62, Jesus goes on and says this, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, let me just share something with you here. It might seem that Jesus was being insensitive, but he wasn't. When Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, we have to dig into that. What was he actually saying? What Jesus was saying is, that's for dead people. Listen to what he's saying. If you go and do that, that's only going to lead you to dead results. The dead belong amongst the dead. If you go back to that place of hurt, come on, come on. if you choose to go and do that first, above what I'm telling you to do, then what he, what he was saying to him is, that's going to leave you in a dead place. What this man did not realize was that in going to bury his father, it would be the death of his breakthrough. And friends, we have to ponder, why do we oftentimes choose people over Christ? Why do we choose people over our imminent breakthroughs? And what we see here, it's a matter of loving people more than loving Jesus. It's a matter of loving 
uh, um, what people offer us in life than the life that Jesus offers us. It's putting something, someone, some place before God. And you see, friends, there's nothing wrong with sincerely loving someone. There's nothing wrong with that. But friends, if that love for a person leads you away from Christ, let me say this to you, friends. While you sincerely love them, you're sincerely deceived. You're sincerely deceived. You're going in the wrong direction. You can't keep the wrong people and expect the right results. And oftentimes the reason why our breakthroughs break down is because we go back. And we still try and keep people in our midst that don't belong there. Can I say this to you fellas and ladies? There's no such thing as missionary dating. She doesn't love Jesus, but I'm going to win her to the Lord. Liar. It's a lie. It's a lie. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. According to the scripture, bad company corrupts good character. Yeah. There's no such thing as missionary dating. Listen, I understand being in relationship with people that don't believe in Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that relationship causes you your relationship with Christ, that's not the one for you. You don't need it. Let's stand here today. You already said you love me, so I'm just saying. Hey, let me remind you what Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says. It is for freedom that you have been set free. Stand firm. As we close this series and we prepare for a new one, I want you to leave this series meditating on the truth in God's word. Friend, God loves you so much. And he has nothing but breakthrough in store for you. Breakthrough. God wants you to live in freedom. God doesn't want you to be strangled by your struggles. No. It is for freedom that he set you free. But you must stand. And if we're going to stand, it takes a decision. The walls that fell down will stay down because I will stand firm. If you believe that with me today, would you lift your hands to heaven? As we look to God, we're doing more than lifting our hands. We're lifting our hearts. We're lifting our lives. And we acknowledge the truth in your word, Lord. It is for freedom that you set us free. You didn't free us from addictions, from struggles. You didn't free us from sin. You didn't free us from, from hurtful past, destructive mindsets for us to go back. And so, Lord, we look to you knowing, Lord, that your story is better than ours. That what you say is what we choose to see from this point forward. Lord, we will follow after you. And we will continue to walk in our freedom because you already paved the way. You gave us breakthrough. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at Church of the Bridge today. I pray that you had a personal encounter with God, that he spoke to you powerfully, and that he met you at your place of need with this message. I also want to encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. By doing so, you'll be able to check out past messages, uh, past events that we've done. You'll also be able to see what's happening now and those things that are to come. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to join with us in all that God is doing with your giving. Feel free to do so on our website. Again, thank you again for joining us, and I can't wait to connect with you next week.